well, Mr. Vasey, welcome. Thank you. And uh, we're very pleased that you've come to the Custard Factory to mark the opening of our new building, Zenig, in which we now sit. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Well, I'm pleased to hear that, and I'm particularly pleased, really. Indeed, it is an act of serendipity that you come, because from what we have been hearing up the road in the posh part of town, your conference has spent quite a lot of time talking about the importance of entrepreneurs and small businesses. That's right. Yeah. So you've come to the right place. We have. Because right here in the custard factory, we've got, I don't know, well over a thousand entrepreneurs, That's mainly amazing. young and all very energetic, working in various forms of creative enterprise, and who between them, over the years, because it's been going quite a long time, have formed a working community which is not only fun, it's also turned out to be extremely fertile commercially. I mean, it really does work from a business point of view and businesses without sacrificing their individuality or their independence find that they can work together in this kind of context. Now, there are over a thousand of them and it might be difficult for you to meet all of them right now. So, we've kind of at random picked three prime examples of this very important species, the creative entrepreneur, uh, who I think generically we hope, are going to make a huge contribution to kick-starting the British economy. And I really do believe that to be the case. I mean, I, I just discovered about half an hour ago from Bryn that there are now more jobs in creative enterprise in Birmingham than there are in the motor industry, which I think is quite extraordinary. Anyway, here they are. Here are three examples. There's Alice, who is a true Renaissance woman. She has done so many things. She's a horticulturalist, a gardener, a champion knitter. She writes regularly for the Times. And now she's just opened a knitting shop in the custard factory, which is the only knitting shop in Birmingham. And this is Bryn. This is Bryn. Now Bryn, I think, is one of the most admirable people I've ever met. For many years, he carried a hod. Eventually, at a relatively advanced age, if you'll pardon me saying so, Bryn, he got fed up with the hood. And one day, he came to the custard factory, he put down his hod, he picked up a paintbrush, and he's been a successful artist ever since, which I think is amazing. And going on from there, there is Amu. Now, there is a man... You may be surprised to have heard he was an MBE, but he deserved it because he works, he works in the promotion of cultural and musical events. And I think you have a strong interest in culture, Mr. Vasey. I do. Yeah. And not only does he do that, he works a lot with young people and children. And that was why three years ago, despite your disbelief, he was awarded the MBE. So here they are as kind of representative of who we all are. We're really delighted that you're here because I think that although we are kind of iconoclastic in a way, it's nice to have friends in the very highest places, Mr. Vasey. And perhaps you'd like to say a few words to the people here. Well, uh, thank you very much for asking me here. It's a delight to be here. What a fantastic and incredible space. And later on, I'm going to be... Uh, walking across the Bridge of Death on the, the third three, floor three of them, three of them, three of them. Uh, to see whether I can uh, summon up the courage to, to do it. It really is uh, a wonderful space. And uh, one of the things you said to me when I arrived was uh, you've built this wonderful uh, sort of hedge uh, contemplation suite uh, like where people will come and meet uh, because you made the point that... Um, one of the greatest things you can have in a place like this is the ability to meet people, network, and have conversations. Yep. It's one of the things I found out when I became an MP. You have this uh, extraordinary opportunity to bring people together. And when you actually do bring people together in a town and 
For example, in Wantage, we set up the Wantage Arts Guild because there were dozens of arts organizations that actually had never sat down and talked to each other, even though they might have been living next door to each other because yeah. they'd never had a space <coughs> to sit down and have a constructive conversation about all the issues that they were interested in that they had in common. Uh, and I think that that might well become the most important part of this building, where people yeah. can actually come and meet each other and exchange ideas. And it's one of the things that I'm trying to concentrate on in my new role as culture minister, is what I call cultural integration, which is that uh, just as government is so ineffective because it works in silos and we don't talk to each other, uh, culture, I think, needs to become more integrated and that people who make video games need to talk to people who run museums and filmmakers and people who want to save historic buildings should have conversations. So I want to enable a lot of conversations across the cultural silos, if I can put it that way. Uh, and I also think it's incredibly important for uh, creative people in the creative industries to have a place like the Custard Factory. I gather you uh, have 101 businesses here. Well, just in this building. So um, we might have to name there this. Are this. Many more. Well, this bit might have to be renamed Room 101. We do have a boardroom, <laughs> and it's called Room 101. It's called Room And people... Uh, you chuck out the bad with, ideas with and trepidation. take yes, up the big absolutely. ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think creative people need uh, the space to create, to get their businesses off the ground. Uh, but as I say, the concentration of like-minded people working in similar fields, I think will create uh, a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. So these kind of spaces are fantastically important. They're as important as a museum or a gallery uh, or any other cultural space that you can think of. So it's a delight for me to be here and learn a bit more about what you're doing. Yeah, well, it's very kind of you to say so. And I want to get hold of that coat. Well, it'll cost you. Yeah. Yeah. We got a vintage shop around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't know to what extent um, Alice or Bryn or Ammo have any particular questions they'd like. Well, to Alice, ask. I know, wants to say something about her work <laughs> and what her view of the uh, creative industries in the future. Oh, I'm just disappointed you've cut the arts funding. Well, we haven't yet. We've actually increased it. We've increased the arts funding, we've uh, increased the lottery, and uh, we've put more money into the arts through the lottery, uh, as you know, uh, and we heard the protests loud and clear a few years ago when Labour cut the arts. As you know, they halved the amount of money going to the arts, and it was good that everyone manned the barricades then to show how angry they were at the Labour government that took arts funding down from 450 million to below 200 million. Now, I know you were there, Alice. Far too young to remember. Okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's a scar on my memory, I can tell you, which is why I'm working so hard to protect the arts, given the huge budget deficit that Labour's left us with. As you know, uh, what government spends and what government earns is now a gap of £180 billion, pounds, not £180 million, £180 billion, and that means that we spend uh, three British museums a day servicing that debt, £120 million pounds a day. So in order to save this economy, to save the arts, which depend on a thriving economy, we've got to make savings. But what you've got is a culture team that is dedicated to the arts that is going to look very carefully at how we can make savings. As I say, one of our first acts was actually to increase arts funding. So although I am a keen Guardian reader, <laughs> I would say that despite that, despite writing for The Guardian for many years, Despite it being my favorite paper, not everything you read in The Guardian is true. Bryn. Hello, Ed. How are you enjoying being our minister? I'm loving it. It's the job I asked for. I went to David Cameron four years ago and said, could I be your culture spokesman? Because I'm a passionate supporter of culture. And uh, he very kindly gave me that job. And obviously, uh, when the coalition government came in, I was absolutely thrilled. Uh, to be given the job as Minister for Culture. There were a hairy few days uh, when I thought it might go to somebody else, but I was delighted when I finally got the job. Well, I'm glad to hear that um, you have a great deal of responsibility now holding this office. Uh, what I'd like to know um, specifically is what will you as Minister be your guidelines to funding uh, places such as the Custard Factory, will you be helping uh, the private enterprise? Whereas when people are looking for new avenues in life, will, will your office be willing to fund that? 
and open those doorways up to people. Well, I think you've got to put in place incentives to allow people to back uh, entrepreneurs and to back creative businesses. One of the problems that creative businesses face is obviously that they are perceived by investors as far more uh, risky. I've lost count at the times when I think people who've got fantastic creative ideas have gone to the bank and been told, well, if you are running a pizza delivery service, of course we'd back you because we know exactly how they work. Yep. Um, we know that people are going to order a certain amount of pizzas, slightly more pizzas during the X Factor, that kind of thing. But they're not willing to take a risk on creative businesses because they never know whether they're going to be successful. So we have to educate investors, but we also have to provide the kind of business investment schemes like the enterprise incentive scheme that will allow people uh, to invest in businesses uh, and uh, reduce the, the risk of that investment, so to encourage that. But also, it's very important for me as a minister, and I'm also a minister in the Department of Business as well, so I can span that divide. It's very important that I make sure that the initiatives that come out of the Department of Business, like the Regional Growth Fund, uh, local economic partnerships and so on, have the interests of the creative industries and culture at their heart. And it's also important as well that government gives very active support to people like Mike Whitby, the leader of Birmingham City Council, who is passionate about culture and the creative industries and wants Birmingham to be seen across the world uh, as a city of culture and a city of creativity. So there are three or four things that we can do uh, to back people like you, Ben. Uh, well, that's, that's all, all good news, I suppose. Uh, it's good news to governing bodies such as the council and the Arts Council and people who um, uh, annually receive an income from the, from the public purse to help, you know, bodies and, and uh, entities that they believe, uh, you know, uh, are enterprising. But that leaves a great majority of people out of the loop. Um, Benny's vision here at the Custard Factory gives uh, the guy off the street an opportunity to build bridges uh, and, and walk into a new way of life. And we feel excluded from some of the bodies, the governing bodies. And what we're looking for, as a, uh, I'm a freelance artist and an in individual sole trader, what we're looking for is government backing so as people can come to the Custard Factory and set mm. up new businesses yeah. if they're made unemployed from government cuts. Yeah. Bryn, I, th yeah. I think a lot of that is happening, and I think that um, whether it be the previous government or this government, um, people do recognise the virtues of trying to generate more economic activity, particularly when it's allied with creative and cultural activities. Um, but I feel somewhat, I feel slightly uneasy about putting our guest on the spot to that extent, Bryn. I think you should be a politician. No, actually. I think uh, well, politicians, no, actually, Benny, politicians are meant to be um, <laughs> uh, put on the spot. And I hear absolutely what Bryn says. I mean, uh, I've just uh, met with an organization called Creative and Cultural Skills that is focused on the skills in the creative and cultural sector. And they are busily promoting apprenticeships in our cultural organizations, which I think is a very good thing that government can uh, help and support, but yes, there are a lot of uh, people, particularly if you talk to people like Tracy Emin and other artists uh, who kind of began their careers in the 80s, who said that the Enterprise Allowance Scheme was a fantastic uh, scheme where you effectively, instead of getting dole money, you got money to pay you to start a small business. And a lot of uh, very successful record producers and creative companies came out of that scheme. So I do think it's worth looking at those kind of initiatives. But I think the other point, Bryn, that you've got to be aware of, the other side of the argument, is that, you know, sometimes government can get in the way. Uh, you know, I don't think a politician or a civil servant could create what Benny's created here. I think you've got to give people the yeah. space to work in their communities, which is what, to a certain extent, the big society is about. It's about giving people the freedom to organize themselves within their own communities to decide yeah. as you effectively decided, probably by a process of osmosis, as opposed to sitting down one day and working out a master plan, uh, that something like the Custard Factory should be here, could work, and so on, and could grow over a period of 20 years to what it is today.